I'm just going to pray for Rachel before she shares with us. Um, Father God, thank you for Rachel. Thank you that she's um, an encourager, a teller of truth, um, someone who looks to build up others, um, and someone who really cares about people um, and wants to see people grow. And I pray um, tonight that as she shares with us, you'd speak um, your words of life to us through what she's prepared. Um, and I pray, as Nigel said, that we would hear from you tonight. Um, would your spirit rest on Rachel now? Amen. Thanks, Hannah. So we're in July, just in case you were wondering about that. And in July, we are exploring um, God's voice. How can we hear God's voice? And because I'm number eight on the Enneagram, which means I'm a challenger, they've given me God's challenging voice to speak out. No, it's nothing to do with that. But I have got the topic of God's challenging voice. So buckle up. This is what we're going to be speaking about. Now, there have been times in my life when I have had to challenge my children's behavior believe it or not. And I have checked that this is okay to share before you think, oh, integrity there. Um, so there was the time when um, we busted one of our kids who kept going to the toilet during mealtimes. And one time, one of us went into the toilet after he'd just come out of the toilet and we found a floating broccoli head in the bottom of the toilet and realized that what he was doing during mealtimes is going, oh, I just really need to go to the toilet. He was having a mouthful of vegetables and spitting them out in the toilet. That was the time. Then there was a time when one of my children got into such a rage that one of them had had a brand new metal matchbox, supersonic, brilliant racing car. And one of the kids was so cross about something, I forget what it was, that he lobbed said racing car from the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs onto the quarry tiles and it was brand new and the, the door span off down the hall and then there was the time when a mother sidled up to me on the way home from school looking slightly sheepish and said um one of your sons i'm not going to say which one it was <laughs> one of your sons has said something unkind to my son Ooh, that stings a little bit when that happens. And um, could you please tell your son off and ask him to apologize? So, as you see, being a parent, you have to challenge your children sometimes. Now, you don't challenge your kids because you want to sort of belittle them. You don't challenge your kids because you want them to feel bad about what they've done, although that might be part of it. You don't challenge them because you want them to feel small and you to feel big. You challenge your kids because you love them. You love them more than anyone else in the world. And what we used to do, when, and we still do it actually, is sit our kids down, but when they were little, we sit them down and we say, the reason I'm telling you off about this is not because I don't like you, it's actually because I love you. I love you so much that I don't want to leave you just doing stuff that is wrong and is going to affect you and affect others. I love you so much that we're going to have this awkward sort of confrontation and this awkward conversation because I want the best for you. I want you to be the best person that you can be. I've got ideas and dreams and aspirations for your future of what you could be like. And I know that if I don't correct you, if I don't challenge that behavior, that's not going to, be, that's not going to happen. So always, as a parent, you know, we're mixed and we're not perfect by any means. You ask my children about that. But all, you know, the underlying feature of challenging your children's bad behavior is love. Is love. And so when we speak about the challenging voice of God, and early on we were singing, you know, you're a good, good father. I have my hands in the air. I was loving it. And then we're thinking the challenging voice of God. How do these two things fit together? Well, they do. They do fit together really well because the challenging voice of God will come to us because he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father that loves us more than any other father. We may have had terrible fathers. We may have been parented badly. We may not have been challenged well about our behavior growing up. But you know what? God is good. He's a good father. And he always wants the best for his children always and it always comes from a place of love now hebrews 12 has a brilliant verse and i hope it's going to come up on the screen and it's this is a great verse that just illustrates what i'm saying so you know that i'm not just making this up this is from the bible and it says this have you forgotten the encouraging encouraging words god spoke to you as his children he said my child don't make light of the lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you 
for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punish, punishes each one he accepts as his child. When God's voice comes to you as a challenge, if it has, how do you respond to that? How do you respond when God challenges you about something? Maybe it's your behavior, maybe it's your attitude, maybe it's something that you're doing wrong, or maybe he wants to sort of nudge you into doing something right. How do you respond? Honestly, it can be tricky because you can feel a little bit guilty. You can feel a little bit like God's conviction is heavy on you. But that verse says that be encouraged. Be encouraged when God disciplines you because he loves you, because you're his child. And if he didn't love you, if he didn't care about you, he wouldn't care about what you were doing. He wouldn't care about what you were up to. He could just leave you to your own devices and say, off you go. I'm not committed to you. I'm not committed to your future. But the reality is he is so committed to us. He is so committed to making us more like Jesus. He is so committed to our discipleship. He is so committed to growing us to be more like the person that he has dreams and aspirations and a vision for us to be, that he will challenge us, as uncomfortable as that might be sometimes, but he will. And this is where we pick up our reading today, and it's from the same book of that verse. It's Hebrews 3. So if you can have that on the screen, and I'll read it. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. Then we're skipping a few verses and going on. So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Oh, okay. I think there's another. Is there another one? There we go. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now, the writer of Hebrews is issuing a challenge to us today. He's issuing a challenge to us. And when, he, when in the Bible it's something is said twice in a short amount of time, you know that he is trying to get a point home. He's trying to emphasize something. And what he's trying to emphasize is that we need to not ignore God's challenge to us. We need to not harden our hearts to what God is asking us to do. And he's giving the example. He's saying, don't be like these guys. They did harden their hearts. And the example he's using is Israel, God's chosen people. The people he loved so much that he rescued them out of Egypt. They'd been oppressed and had been enslaved for 400 years. But he said, I'm going to rescue you and lead you to the promised land. And what he did, he, he swept in through Moses, as is mentioned in the beginning of that, that reading, and rescued these guys from a life of slavery and oppression and promised to lead them to the promised land. But all didn't go well. Because the journey, which should have taken two weeks, took 40 years. That is a lot of wandering in the desert, isn't it? In circles, in triangles, in I don't, hexagons, maybe? I don't know. I don't know my shapes very well. I failed maths. Um, but they did a lot of wandering in the desert, 40 years worth of wandering when they could have done it in two weeks because they were just a bunch of moaners. Their hearts were hard. They were critical. They moaned about what God had done. They 
were rebellious. They thought they knew what was best for them when God had said what was best for them. And the list goes on. All because they hardened their hearts. And yet, they had experienced so much. They had seen God do amazing things. They had seen miraculous things. They had seen plagues of, of frogs and boils, and they had seen rivers of blood coming through, through Egypt. They had seen the angel of death come and kill the firstborn children. They had been rescued out of a city that, where they were pressed in. They were led across the Red Sea. They saw the water being held up left and right, you know, huge walls of water that they walked through and then they saw come behind them and kill all the Egyptians. They had not kind of, you know, is God with us? I'm not really sure. They had seen miraculous things and yet that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Their hearts were hard. How does that happen? What sort of people are they that can see such amazing things from God, can see miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet their hearts were hard? What sort of people are like that? People like me, and maybe people like you. See, the writer of Hebrews is writing to believers. He's writing to people who follow Jesus. He's writing to people who have tasted Jesus, have tasted what it is to belong to him. And yet they're in danger of hardening their hearts. They're in danger of turning their back on God, of drifting away, of taking their eyes off of Jesus and putting them on other things. And it happens slowly. It doesn't happen normally in one blast, massive thing. It happens slowly, one decision, one choice at a time. The writer in Hebrews often talks about drifting away. So a drift sets in. And he tells them to hold fast, hold fast, don't drift. There's this really funny verse which I wanted to tell you about. It's in Numbers, and um, it's about the children of Israel, and they are really at the height of moaningness, if that is a word. And God has been feeding them miraculously every day with this incredible, miraculous manner. Every time they go to bed and it's not there, and then they wake up in the morning, they open their tents, and there's this miraculous food that God has provided, and they eat all they need, and then the next day it's gone, and then it appears again every morning. And it, it is a miracle every day. And yet, they are sick to death of manna. They're sick to death of God's provision, and they say this, "'We remember the fish we ate in Egypt.'" At no cost, they've forgotten they were slaves. Also, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and garlic. Honestly, this is in your testament. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. And quite frankly, we've had enough of it. I added that last bit on. What they want to do, they want to trade the miracle of God's provision and freedom for a fish salad in captivity. They are harping back to their five a day, forgetting that that meant they were slaves. Life in Egypt was grim. They were slaves. But I think there's something in this for us tonight. Very often, what we harp back to will lead us into slavery, will lead us into captivity. Maybe the old vices, the old habits, the ways of doing things, the ways of doing life that seemed easier without all this following God's laws and obeying God. It seems attractive and easy and better. But like the Israelites, what it does, it leads us back to a place where we are captive. It leads us away from God's true freedom. Because what is freedom looks unattractive and what is captivity looks like a fish salad. And what's the choice going to be when God is challenging us to walk towards freedom, when actually what we're after is a, is a fish salad? And it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Often it's about hearing God's voice 
and ignoring it. Or hearing God's challenge about something in our lives and rejecting it. Or sensing God's nudge about something, some area in our lives or an attitude, maybe even a thought process or something that we're doing and, and disengaging with the nudge. Putting our theoretical fingers in our ears, you know, and, and pretending that we can't hear it. And before you know it, you've drifted away. You've drifted away and you've become desensitized to God's voice. It's like, I can't hear God's voice anymore. Where is it? Well, he hasn't moved. It's always us. And then, as sometimes happens, we reach a point where the sin has sort of cluttered up our lives. It feels like it's built up a barrier between us and God. And we're just, sometimes we have a bit of a wake up moment or a bit of a revelation. And we're like, how did I, how did I get here? Is it too late? to head back to God? Is it too late to find him again? It's never too late. It's never too late. Jesus tells this amazing story in Luke 15. It's the parable of the prodigal son. You may be familiar with it. The son, he asks for his inheritance. He wants freedom. He thinks it's freedom, but actually it's slavery. And he goes off and he spends all his money on, on parties and women and dancing and fun. And then he gets to the end of it and he realizes, I've got no money. I've got no friends. I've got no nothing. I've spent my life doing not very much and have nothing to show for it. And I'm trapped. I'm trapped. And he comes to his senses and says, actually, my father's servants had a better life than me. Maybe if I go back and grovel to my father, he might welcome him in. So he turns back, he goes to visit his father. Of course, his father is standing, watching the horizon, waiting for his son to come home and he sees him. And he runs towards him and he opens his arms and he engulfs him and he throws a party. He says, my son is back. I thought he was lost, but he's been found. It's never too late. It's never too late to respond to the challenging voice of God. It's never too late because he loves us. And there's always an invitation to return to him. And maybe tonight you feel a bit estranged from God. Maybe tonight you feel like you've, like the Israelites, you've gone for the fish salad and walked away from the freedom that God offers. You've sort of fallen back into old habits of living, old ways of doing life. You're thinking, is it too late? You know, I've been here before many times. Can I, can I make my way back to God? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The challenging voice of God is there because he loves us, because he loves you, and he wants us to return. So how do we keep our hearts soft towards God? Well, this passage helps us. It gives us three directives that if we can implement, if we can draw into our lives. It will help us keep our hearts soft. And I'm just going to whiz through them, there's three of them. And they all begin with F, a bit like Nigel's ones last week, beginning with P. And they didn't all begin with P, actually. But mine do begin with F. <clears throat> we're, not, we're not in competition, by the way. So the first thing, the first thing is fix your eyes on Jesus. It says in verse one, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Hebrews talks about it a lot. In another chapter 12, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means that remember that Jesus is above every other name. Jesus is superior over every other being in the whole entire universe. He is beyond everything. If you want to know what he's like, Read Colossians 1, verse 15 in the message. That can be your homework tonight. Go home and read it. It talks about he's the beginning, he's the end. He is the beginning and the end. He is above and beyond everything. And we see this truth in the fact that he's the only one that died for us and defeated death and came back to life. Fix your eyes on him. Take them off all the other things that absorb your attention and fix your eyes on him. This morning in our 11 a.m. service, we had the real joy of baptizing a lady. 
And I, I, she's from a country that actually, a few years ago, it was actually illegal to be a Christian in. And she is the first person in her family to become a Christian. None of her, her family are Christians apart from her. And today, we baptise her. And she talked about the fact that she used to worship Buddha. She used to worship Buddha. That, that was the religion of her ancestors. But Buddha couldn't do anything for her anxiety or her depression or her feeling of like, I think love is out there for me, but I just can't find it. I can't experience the love that I think I should until she found Jesus. And this morning she talked about how she'd found a love that surpassed everything, a love that surpassed Buddha, a love that surpassed even the people that told her she was, was ridiculous to commit her life to Jesus. A love that made her stand up in front of her friends and family who don't know him and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. He is my beginning and my end. My left and my right. He is before me and behind me. This is the Jesus that we follow, that we love, that loves us. Fix your eyes on him. Secondly, find your people. Find your people. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We need other people to do life as as a Christian, to do life with Jesus. We cannot do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We're not meant to be Jesus followers in isolation of other people. So if you're the sort of person that kind of finds it difficult to make community with Christians, or maybe you, you just come to church when you can, or maybe... You know, you're here and you just feel like, oh, I'm on the fringes. Can I encourage you to find your people? Find some people who are for you and not against you. People who will pray for you when life is hard. People who you can open the Bible with together and read it and see how God's word comes out and jumps at you. And people who can say, how are you doing? How, what sin is it you're struggling with today? I mean, that's a big question to ask somebody, isn't it? And to say to somebody else, actually, I'm really struggling with this. I'm struggling to forgive this person but people who are for you and not against you and if you're not in a small group or if you're not in a community group or if you're not in a pastor or if you don't have any other Christian friends can I encourage you to find some maybe go to the information desk that'll give them a headache won't it go to the information desk and say I want to I want to join in I want to find some people because if we haven't got people around us who will spot when our heart is hardening who will look at us and go, something's not quite right, what is it? Who will see when you're struggling and life is hard, who you can share that with, or who can see when you're full of joy and you're on the top of the world because life is great. If you don't have your people, then it's really hard to do life with Jesus. Even Jesus had his people. He had 12 of them. And he kept them close, and they watched him like a hawk, and they knew when he was high, they knew when he was low. They knew when he was in sorrow, and they knew when he was celebrating. And if we want our hearts to remain soft, we need our people around us. Thirdly, remember your first love. Remember your first love. It's a phrase that is used in Revelation when it's talking about a church that has become lukewarm and passive whose hearts are neither hot nor cold. And this verse says, We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. How was it originally when you found Jesus and Jesus found you? What was it like? I have been married for 28 years. That is quite something, isn't it? I deserve a little whoop or something. Yeah, there we go. That's enough. That's fine. Um, Yes. But, you know, when I first got married to my husband, you know, we were madly in love. And Martin would say that he still is madly in love. Of course, we're both still madly in love. But, you know, the love that we felt at the beginning of our relationship, our marriage, is not the same as it feels now. Because we've been married for 28 years. It's a long time. But I still love him, and he still loves me. But sometimes when it gets hard, when life throws at you difficult circumstances and you're wondering how you're going to get through this and whether this is the right person to get through this with, it is always, is to remember back to that commitment we made in front of other people. 
and said, actually, this is, this is the guy for me. This is the guy for me. Remember those heady days of in loveness, which meant that he would write a letter to me every day and I would write one once a week. Remember those days when, that is actually true, I'm a terrible person. Remember those heady days when I would do anything. He would drive through the night five hours to, to, get, to get to visit me because we live so far apart. You know, that, that is a sign of our love for each other. What was it like when you first met Jesus? What was it like to feel that amazing forgiveness of sin for the first time, that flood of joy? Or if it's been a slow burner, what has it been like along the ways when you've experienced the Holy Spirit, you've experienced Jesus' love, you've experienced his empowering? Remember what it was like. Don't let those things fritter, flitter away like they didn't matter, like the, Egypt, like the Israelites did. They, oh, yeah, there's miracles, yeah. So what? Hold on to those things. Remember your first love. As we end, I want to, I want to challenge you because I'm a challenger. I want to challenge you to just take a moment to just think about what your heart is like today. In Hebrews, it kept saying, today, if you hear this message, do not harden your hearts. What is your heart like today? What is God's voice saying to you today? Israel had a hard heart. The signs were there. They didn't trust God. They didn't live according to his commands. They thought they knew better than God. They were critical and discontented. They were fearful of the future. They were ungrateful. They moaned when trials came along. They wanted to return to their old life and walk away from freedom. Maybe some of you can identify with some of those attitudes. You know, when my heart is getting when my heart, when my heart is getting hard, there are some things that I can sense in me. I get a bit judgmental about other people. I can become a little bit critical of others and feel like I'm right about everything and everybody else is wrong. Actually, I think that most of the time, actually, but I feel it particularly bad if my heart is hard. Just kidding. You know, I feel in me, I can feel I'm getting judgmental. It's a sign to me that my heart is toughening up. What are the signs for you when your heart is getting calloused and hard towards God? Because you know what? It's not about, it's not only about being hard-hearted towards God. It affects others. It affects others. It has fallout everywhere we go, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our workplaces, with those we live, when we leave it unchecked. Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today is a day where we can get right with God. Today is a day when we can experience an amazing rush of forgiveness. Today is a day when we can hear God's challenging voice and respond, knowing that he's for us and he loves us and he's wanting to will us on to be the people that he wants us to be. Today is a day where we can say, yes, Holy Spirit, come. Soften my heart. Help me to be the person that you want me to be, not who I want me to be, but who you want me to be. There's this wonderful verse in Ezekiel, which I'm going to read as, just as I pray. It says, so it's a promise. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. There's a promise there that God can exchange and change our tough heart and make it soft. And he can put his spirit in us so that we're not following his laws out of legalism and on a heavy yoke, but his spirit leads us to want to obey what God is calling us to do 
to follow the challenges and the leadings that his spirit is leading us to. And we're going to pray now. What I'd, what I'd love you to do in the quiet, really, I, I loved what we did last week. We just had a bit of quiet after Rob's sermon. And you know, in our really noisy life where our phones are huge distractions and where we re- very rarely get unplugged, I think being quiet is a really good thing. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to just, you are sitting, stay sitting, just be quiet for like 30 seconds. And in that moment, I'm just going to ask you to ask God a question. And the question is, Father God, do you want to challenge me about anything? Do you want to challenge me about anything tonight? So let's just be quiet and ask him that question. If, like me, you would like the Holy Spirit to come and just soften your heart again towards God, towards God's ways, towards the things that God has in mind for you, then I'm just going to invite you where you sit to just put your hand on your heart, wherever you think that might be. (laughs) I'm just going to pray for us before I hand back to Nigel and Hannah. Father God, I thank you that you challenge us because you love us. We just welcome your Holy Spirit to come and to soften our hearts where they've become hard, maybe through no fault of our own, maybe through difficult circumstances or or things that have been out of our control, maybe because of our own choices. However, however, They've become hardened. We just welcome you, Holy Spirit, and say, come and soften our hearts, that we would be people that love like you, that love you, that are moved by the things that move you, that live with gentle, kind spirits, that reveal your love to the world, that we're undefended, we're kind, where we see people as you see them. We're moved to do the things and be the people that you you would move us to be. We say, Spirit, come. We want our hearts to be malleable malleable in your hands so that you can make them as you want them to be. We we surrender to you. We surrender. Fill us with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.